Uh, turn with me, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 1, and actually let's begin in verse 15, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. This you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phagelius and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of, of Anisophorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. So this morning, uh, if we had a little title, it would be uh, something like this, A Fresh Breath of Air. Amen. A Fresh Breath of Air. Amen. And that's the objective, that's the goal that each of us have to be to that kind of uh, experience to those who are around us and even people from around the world like that little shoebox thing you know we saw that video of the testimony of the young lady who's now in her 20s but when she was like what six years old I think it was somebody put a little dress in that shoebox and it fit her and it was the first time she had ever had a dress before and she just thought she was on top of the world. It was one of the greatest gifts she had ever received in her life. And uh, I'm sure the person that put it in the box didn't think anything of it. But boy, it was some kind of fresh air. It was some kind of encouragement uh, to that little girl who is now a young adult remembering and is remissing backwards in time. So I want to talk about this morning this idea of being an encouragement, being someone uh, who doesn't bring, uh, if I could say this, bad breath, okay? Uh, Listerine is important, you know? Uh, if you don't have many friends, are you, are you using mouthwash, you know? Are you brushing your teeth? That's, that's one of the sure way to get people to run away from you. So, uh, we want to take care of our personal hygiene, but we're not talking about that this morning, are we? We're talking about our spiritual hygiene. So the Apostle Paul, let's give some context here. He's in um, a prison cell. Now, this is his second time to be in prison there in Rome. The first time he was in prison, uh, remember we spoke about the fact that the church of Philippi helped him, right? and I can't even say the guy's name. They came over and helped him. It's, it's hard to say. But they sent somebody. They sent a gift. They sent some money. He went over there, and it wasn't difficult to find Paul in his first imprisonment because he was in a house. And everybody knew where he was because he had free reign. So he could go all over. He could share the gospel. You know, the Rome just gave him an ankle bracelet, you know. And so he could go around. He could share the gospel. He had this freedom. Well, he was let go, and then we don't know how much longer, but it wasn't too much longer after that, because we're probably in 64, 65 AD. He's arrested again, we think maybe around Ephesus, and he's taken to Rome. This time, he's not in a house. He's a real prisoner this time. He's in a dirty, dingy, cold cell. He's in chains. He's um, in a place that's not easy to get to, and it's not easy to find. And he knows that his time is short. So he's got what we would say lots of problems to work out. And there's a lot of uncertainty in his life. And so he speaks about um, this particular time in his life uh, that was very, very taxing for him. He needed some refreshment. Well, we all do. We all need refreshment at times. 
My, uh, I spread the story with says the man who seldom finds himself in hot water is the one with a wife, several daughters, and one bathroom. And then an exhaustive study shows that no woman has ever shot her husband while doing the dishes. <laughs> Who can forget Winston Churchill's immortal words, we shall fight on the beaches, on the landing grounds, in the fields, in the streets, and in the hills. And one man said, that sounds like our family vacation. <laughs> there are... Um, there are times when things get more difficult and, uh, and we all need this time and we need refreshment. The, the time that I thought of, I wasn't there. Brother Carl <coughs> Ray was in early service. He's an early service guy now. and They can be fed and in bed by the time we start church, the late service. And um, I went back to 1957 1956, in the old sanctuary that we had here at the church, which we still have. We use it as a Sunday school and stuff for kids and all that kind of thing. Well, there was a day when there was, what, no air conditioning, right? So all the stained glass windows were open. And by the way, you know, we were doing the Lord's Supper not long ago, and we were talking about, well, why do they have the you know, the sheet over the elements. You know, why do we cover all that? Who started that deal, and why did they do that? Have you ever asked questions like, why do we do the, the things that we do? And someone read the reason they put the, the sheet over the elements is because before they had air conditioning, what did they have? Flies, that's right, and Texas bugs. And nobody wanted the bugs to be nibbling on their stuff before they got it, so they would cover it. So back in the day... Up until 1956, 1957, all the windows were open. So not only were they hot, but the bugs were flying everywhere. And I asked him because, they, you know, they did the church thing on Sunday night. And I said, did y'all use, like, mosquito repellent? And he said, oh, yeah, we had to put all that on there because the mosquitoes came through the window. So don't you know that when they finally got their first air conditioning, Everybody was really, really excited. It was like a fresh breath of fresh air. And, of course, we know, I've told you this before, that's when all the Methodists moved over and became Baptists because <laughs> they were still hot over there. So a breath of fresh air. Yeah, that's the thought here this morning. This is what Paul needed. As I thought about this little context, and what Paul is telling us, I thought about two groups. Here's the first group, those who desert, those who flee, those who run, those who head for the exit door. These people in the first group would not be the people you would want in your own personal foxhole. Paul mentions all in Asia had deserted him. Well, I, I think he's probably using some hyperbole there. I'm sure not every single person in Asia had deserted him. But what he's sharing with us, I think, is some of his emotion, some of his feelings. Did you know that Paul was a human being too? He was a person just like you and me. He had feelings and he's at a time when he really needs somebody to stand at his side and help him and tell him they're praying for him and, hey, I'm not going anywhere as long as you're in this deal. I'll be there at your side. He didn't really have too many folks like that. And he, he's feeling the pain of that, the brunt uh, of that. The others who claim to be believers, they left him. As long as the air conditioning was on, they were front and center. They were in attendance. You could count on them. But as soon as the air conditioner went bad, that's when it got a little stuffy. He mentions two of these people by name. He mentions Phagelius and Homogenes. Maybe he mentions them, and I think he probably does, because Timothy probably knows them as well. 
In fact, Timothy probably served alongside these two guys in church. They probably did a lot of stuff together. They probably did revivals together. And it must have been very painful for the Apostle Paul to think of all the people, including these two, that he had worked with who had now deserted him when the rough got going or when the going got rough. And it must have been tough. As they dropped Christianity as though it had never existed, these two men Paul mentioned were probably at one time very close to him. So why did they do that? Why did they leave? Why did the le- or all the other people leave? Well, I don't know for sure. He, he gives us some indications here of some thoughts here about some of the problems. One of them was they might have been ashamed of Paul's gospel. Yeah, they might have been afraid of what others thought when they saw what Paul stood for, when he, what he lived for. It was something that they did not in the long run want to be identified with. So like the folks who just got baptized this morning, you know what they were saying? They were saying, we have identified ourselves with Jesus Christ, with the Lord of lords and the King of kings. We are part of him. We are part of his family, and we're not ashamed to say that to everybody else. That's what happens when somebody comes forward to be baptized. Many times in our church, you know, I'll lead the little sinner's prayer so people can ask the Lord to come in their life. And they can do that in private. But then, now that they're a Christian, God says, you can't stay in private anymore. You need to come out and be public about your faith. What are you doing when you're public? You're saying, I'm identifying with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to show that, express that through baptism so that everyone will know that I belong to him. If you've never been baptized, there's no reason for anyone to think that you belong to him. And what an encouragement. I told them all back there, I said, there'll be somebody out there and they need to be baptized. They know they do. And they, they, for some reason or another, they haven't come forward for baptism, even though they've asked Jesus Christ. And they're going to see you and they're going to be great. You're going to be like a breath of fresh air. And they're going to go, wow, if little Otto can do that, if little Cadence can do that, I can do that. And if the big people can do it, I can do it. So, Maybe they were ashamed, I I don't know. Maybe they were ashamed not of the gospel so much, maybe they were ashamed of his chains. Maybe that was the problem. You see, Nero was in charge at this point. Nero was one brutal guy. He killed most of his family members as much as, as well as so many other people. You remember the fire, you know, going on in Rome when he blamed the Christians and they burned a lot of Christians. For, boy, and he also made it law that he was God and that you had to confess Caesar as Lord. Well, so if you weren't going to do that, it was off with your head. And so there were a lot of folks who were claiming to be Christians and when it came down to martyrdom, and they said, I think I'll keep my head. And they would deny the Lord. But, you know, you cannot become a Christian unless you say Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, When we are sharing with people, like, for example, who are Hindus, we're not saying, oh, just add, add Jesus to your collection. We're saying, no, you are saying there is no other God out there in the universe. Jesus is the Lord of lords, the King of kings. He's the only way to God the Father. He's it. There's no other. There are not many ways to heaven. There's only one way. Of course, I'm preaching to the choir here today. But it's something that we have to remember when we're talking to people from other religions with other gods, little g. You're not adding to your collection. And maybe they were ashamed. Maybe they were afraid to stand beside Paul because you know, in that day, it wasn't you're innocent till you're proven guilty. You're, if you're just guilty by association. So all you have to do is stand next to a guy that is in jail. And he might as well have been convicted. And if you stand by him, you're just as good as dead too. Well, they're like, I'm not ready to go yet. And so 
maybe that was their problem. Maybe it was that they had a little bit of this, that they loved the world. You remember what Paul said later about Demas. He said, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and he has departed to Thessalonica. Maybe there was some of that going on, where they just weren't ready to forsake their old ways and the love of this world. The pitch and the lure of the world catches a lot of folks. Maybe it was, um, there was just too much heat, just too much commitment, just too much work. It was just too difficult. Remember, I asked you, if you hadn't done it already, to read Pilgrim's Progress. If you had or if you haven't, go look for Mr. Pliable as his life will apply to what we are speaking about. Now, let me just pause and say something here. Every single one of us in this room today has regrets. We have things in our lives, times in our lives, when we were a discouragement to someone else. And here's what happens. Sometimes people think, well, I, I, I failed, so what can I do now? God can't do anything with me now. Listen, if you're alive and you're a Christian, God has work for you to do. And part of that work is being an encouragement to the people around you. So here's what the devil does. He will bring up that old past event in your life so that you will relitigate it. And here's what the Lord does for me when that happens in my life because I'm just like you too. And God, I'll hear God say, you know, Mike, that was in the past. There's nothing that you can do about to change the past. And if you relitigate the past, and in the past, I've already forgiven you for what's in the past. You've already dealt with it. You're not going to be any good to anybody else in the present. So let it go, man. Don't relitigate it. Let me use you today. Let me help you to become like fresh air a breath of fresh air to the people around you, a pleasant scent, and it happens to all of us. You have to learn how to deal with the devil's tricks. I mean, God has forgiven you for your sins in Jesus Christ, past, present, and future. Yes, I confess them, and I learn from them, case in point. John Mark. First missionary journey. He's doing great till it got a little tough, till it got a little difficult. He didn't really like the temperature in the foxhole. And so he said to Paul, he said to Barnabas, I'm out of here. I'm going back to Mama where she does all my clothes and cooks all my meals. Paul was not happy about it. He was so unhappy about it that he wouldn't even take John Mark on the second missionary tour. Barnabas said, no, I see this as a redemptive plan here. God still has a plan for John Mark. You can mess up. You can become a discouragement and put that in the plural. And you don't think God could still use that person? Well, he sure did in the area of John Mark. Because what did he end up doing? spending a lot of time with the Apostle Peter in order to write the very first gospel account, the Gospel of Mark. Later, Paul will say, and I, I watched that movie, I forgot the name of it, Paul or something, and they, what we saw was Luke coming down to, to see Paul in this prison that he's in in Rome. So, it wasn't just our guy that we're talking about today. It was also Luke. And Luke, of course, spent a lot of time with Paul because he's going to write the book of Acts. And what does Paul tell him? Bring John Mark with you because he is a great asset to my ministry and my life. 
Don't relitigate the past that God has already forgiven you for. Now, we can learn from it so that we can turn around and use that value of those failures and that discouragement so we can help others and maybe they won't fall in the same tracks that we did. And God will use us. God wants to use you. You are alive because God wants to partner with you in ministry to be a refreshment. <clears throat> now, there's a second group here that I want to talk about, and that's the group that is an encouragement. I want to be an encouragement. I want to help folks. Ted Turner criticized fundamentalist Christianity and said Jesus probably would be sick at his stomach over the way his ideas have been twisted. That's what he said years ago. Turner said he had been, a, in, he had been raised in a strict Christian upbringing and at one time had considered becoming a missionary. He said, I was saved seven or eight times. But he became disenchanted with Christianity after his sister died despite his prayers. And Turner said, the more he strayed from his faith, he said, the better I felt. Well, you know what the problem is with Ted is he, he just made a decision seven or eight times, but he never got saved. When you get saved, God begins to change your life and it gives you a burden for other people. And, you know, that doesn't mean that it's all going to be wonderful and terrific and everything's going to be like Disney World or Disneyland or Fiesta, Texas or Six Flags over Texas. It's not going to always be like that. We're going to have trouble sometimes. The Christian expects that. But because Jesus really lives in his heart, he's decided to identify with the Lord. He presses on. He endures. So this guy, this guy, our guy, Hamajimus, he goes to this place place in Rome he leaves Ephesus and the Bible says that he's got to search Paul out because he's not easy to find and he didn't give up looking around the first street corner he kept looking and looking and looking and finally he found him and he came to this place where Paul was he brought a gift with him he brought his life with Paul notices also he references him as the household of Anisiasporus that means he's probably a rich man. God's using a rich man. God's using a wealthy man here. But this wealthy man is making a good decision in how he wants God to use his life and his resources. And so he comes and he stands there. Here's the problem for Paul, I think. It was, it was, it's like it wasn't bad enough that he's in prison, that he's in chains, that he's in this cold place that he knows that he's going to get his head lopped off. It wasn't bad enough to know that he wasn't like in the house arrest where he could go around and preach the gospel. No, he's in this place where he doesn't have an opportunity to preach the gospel anymore. The very thing that he wants to do the most, he doesn't have the liberty to do it anymore. And it is, if that isn't bad enough, on top of all that, now these two guys and many others have deserted him. It was the icing on the cake. And so I say God speaks to us through the Apostle Paul's life and he wants to use us to be an encouragement to others. This concept is also seen in uh, Philemon 1 7, for we have great joy and consolation over our love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. 1 Colossians Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 17. I am glad the coming of Stephanus and Fortunus and Archaeus, for these supplied your lack, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. And that's what we're talking about. The group that I want to be in is even though I may be feeling the heat, just because somebody becomes toxic does not mean I'm going to stand, not stand with them. So 
last week, as we begin to close and think about all this, I I um, been getting these emails. Not just the Christmas boxes, but last week we talked to you about the little boat in Belize. And some of you gave last Sunday, and some of you have been giving already before that, and some of you will give in the future. And I just want to I just want to say something to you here this morning about that, in addition to the little Christmas boxes. So something happened Monday. You know, we did our thing Sunday. And what happened was, it's like God, Bob says, you know, Mike, when you, when you, when you got through doing the still in the sermon, it's like the floodgates just came open, like because we were speaking out about it in faith. And so Monday, this missionary that Bob had been speaking to went to North Carolina, and he spoke to a boat builder there. And the boat builder made a commitment to build a hull out of fiberglass, not aluminum, which is so much cheaper, and to do it at cost. This is an awesome thing. So they were working through the details and the design of all this. But what I didn't realize was all this stuff this boat is going to do. I'm thinking, you know, it's carrying a few people here. No, it's, it's more than that. He, he writes a lot of stuff about this. And let's see if I can find it here where he describes this. something you can't find it it's right here yeah here we go so he says uh, this little boat is going everywhere it's going the, the only access that these people have that they're working with is through water he says so what we're doing with this little boat is we are hauling items like steel rebar Pallets of 90-pound bag cement, cement blocks. We haul sand and gravel for construction, for filler pack for wells, filter packs for wells, water well drill equipment. And he said, uh, livestock, mostly pigs. I had no idea they're going to be carrying pigs. Charcoal and farmer's produce and uh, a four-wheeler. And he said, for us normally to carry all that stuff, we'd have to pay a barge $700 U.S. for one day. He said, are we going to hand load and unload all this stuff? We're also going to be able to use this boat as a refuge to sleep on when we need to. And it's going to be able to go back here in this, to all these little villages where nobody else, and I'm just telling you, Bob, I'm just telling you. As I'm watching these emails, I'm listening to him, you know, I'm telling you, our church has been a great encouragement to him, the missionary there, Bob and Rhonda. I, it's been like a breath of fresh air, what you guys have done and what you're doing. And the only thing I would ask you to continue doing, too, is pray. Pray for Bob, pray, pray for Rhonda, pray for this boat, because through this boat, we're going to reach the catchy people who can't read and write. And if they get to go to church, it's in Spanish, and they're not fluent in Spanish. So we're going to be able to give them the Word of God orally, and they're going to be able to help them drink clean water so they can live long enough for us to talk to them about. But you have been a great encouragement to them, and along with those little Christmas boxes. I just don't want to be in the group of discouragement. Yes, I've discouraged people in the past, but I don't have to stay there. I can be in this group where I can encourage people and let God use me today without relitigating the past, and you can too. You can be like Anisiphorus. May God help us to be like him. Let's pray. So let me just let you pray for a minute about someone that you know of that you could be an encouragement to. I even got some 
little cards this week from people in our church and actually people outside my church who said, Mike, I'm thinking about you and I'm praying for you and I appreciate you. Oh, gosh. You talk about making your day. Sometimes you feel like you're all alone, but you know people like that. And they feel like they're all alone. It's just a little card, a little thought, a little phone call. And actually praying for them is like a breath of fresh air. Let me let you just pray. Has God put somebody on your heart, somebody in your life to be an encouragement to? While you're praying, maybe someone needs to make a decision this morning. Maybe to make their decision to follow Christ public, to be baptized some day in the near future, maybe to join the church, whatever it is. I'll be standing right here at the front. Just stand up and come as the Lord leads you. And even if you would like to visit after the service, I'll be glad to do that too. So we'll wait just a moment. Just stand and come as the Lord leads you.